sexual abuse, predators at large, recidivity rates. This is a strong challenge to men, pastors and priests and it's not for the faint of heart. The dictionary definition of the term recidivism to relapse into a previous condition or mode of behavior and especially delinquency or criminal activity. It's used very often in the case of sex offenders who then go back to those ways and habits to exhibit recidivism. To fall back, lapse, regress, relapse, return, revert, turn back. One veteran counselor shared with me that the recidivity rate or fallback rate among sex offenders can be as high as 90 to 95 percent, meaning at the least they ought to be closely monitored if they are ever released back into society by some bleeding heart judges. How much the more if the sex offender is a pastor or a priest or minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ? No one should risk putting such a person back in the pulpit. They should be defrocked permanently. Let him get a secular job and wear an anklet that tracks his whereabouts. There can be no reinstatement for one like this whose very premises, that's like the church premises, were considered to be safe in the first place. Yes, they can get plugged back into the body of Christ, come and attend church, but not back into public ministry. By the way, some stats show that the recidivity rates among men to be between 50 and 70 percent if you check online but it does not take into account the huge numbers of unreported sex offenses. Let's talk about ease of predation, especially in situations where employees are at the mercy of their employers. More so, though not exclusive to, to, to developing countries, oftentimes employees would be willing to get sexually involved with their boss for reasons of perks and promotion. And this can work both ways, whether the boss is male or female and with the employees. I'm aware of one too many such abusive situations where it starts out with one employee and then another and then how much is enough. And no one is willing to bell the cat as they want job security and need the job and the money or finances. Worse yet is when the advances from the boss are gently and tactfully declined or sometimes it, they have to be repelled by an employee, then that employee ends up getting fired because of their integrity, shame. The same methodology Listen to this, has been in vogue in place in Hollywood for decades now, where almost every budding actress, young lady hoping to make it in the acting world, writes DPA, DPA on their application for a job, for a role in a play, in, in, in a movie. And what does DPA mean? Directors preference allowed or director's preference acknowledged. In other words, sir, you can do with me as you wish. Sleep with me, do what you want, but give me, cast me that role so I can get started in my acting career. DPA. So we can see this practice of women abuse is far reaching. Not only is it common with bosses and their secretaries, at places of work, but sadly even in the church. It could be worship leaders with ladies in the church worship team. Next thing you know, he's left his wife and run away with another lady from the worship team. Pastors with secretaries in the church 
or with other ladies in the church or on staff. One senior pastor wisely said to me once, please don't take offense, I'm just giving you a quote, and he meant it in a, in a good way to protect himself. He said to me once, my next secretary is going to be overweight and unattractive. In other words, I don't want to be ensnared into this trap of the enemy. Mind you, I haven't even touched on the issues of homosexuality and lesbianism within with Roman Catholic priests and nuns, or molestation of altar boys by priests, etc. Not to make any excuses whatsoever, but that egregious, egregious means way over the top. Sexual abuse is a direct result of the Vatican enforcing a totally unbiblical celibacy on these nuns and priests who become sexually suppressed and oppressed, and so who in turn sodomize and victimize the hapless children that are entrusted to their care. Back to egregious, E-G-R-E-G-I-O-U-S, egregious, over the top, sinful behavior. If such is being done even by Roman Catholic priests and adulterous Protestant pastors, then what hope is there for the laity or the regular secular person? You may ask, Brother Andrew, how is this possible with priests and pastors? Here are some examples from my life. I can only speak authoritatively for myself and the temptations that are out there for pastors and ministers men and women of God. We have projects in Asia, South Pacific. We travel to the US, to, to Australia. So, so we're in multiple countries. In one of our projects, one of my staff asked me, I said, we need to discuss early in the morning, 5 a.m. I was up early because of jet lag. We need to discuss such and such today. It's 5 a.m. This lady says, would you like me to come over now? 5 a.m. Knowing my wife's not there. So you ask, how is it possible with priests and pastors? All I have to do is accept it. You know what my response was? No, no, no. Later in the day, we will meet and discuss this, whatever the issue was at hand. You've got to stand up. You need the fear of God. You need the Holy Spirit to guide you, to make a stand for righteousness and truth. I went to a lawyer's office in that same country and a female employee in that lawyer's office. Upon learning that my then ailing wife and young son were back in the USA, she said these words to me with about three employees in the office at, this, at that time. Oh, single and in our country. We can do something about that. In other words, just let me know. Another restaurant owner, single lady, we had eaten at her restaurant, my late wife and I, a few times. She had seen us. She had an idea what we do, that we have a significant project. I happened to be checking in at a, uh, at a motel, searching, asking for somebody at the office desk. This lady who owned the restaurant was sitting in the foyer of that motel. And she started to engage me in conversation. When I was in a hurry, I needed to go. And then, how are you? I said, I'm fine. Where's your family? I said, they're in the States. Oh, would you like to come back to my room for a coffee? All you have to do is say yes. And that's it. Satan has you, my friend. Another country where we have a project, a friend from the gym said to me, and this was an implicit reference to people sleeping around and bed hopping. She said these words, it's nothing really, meaning sleeping around is commonplace. And she's a friend from the gym. Sleeping around is commonplace 
for other gym members. In other words, what are you holding out for? Come on, it's no big deal. Another church lady, because I'm preaching in a different church every Sunday, comes on very sweet and is happy to flirt openly. I have to guard myself and my heart. Another lady on staff at the gym, staff member lady, making overtures of availability. Another country, a one translator of mine, flirting with me, trying to flirt when we sit down between lectures just to have a casual conversation. One of my host families in a certain country, the wife going overboard and being super nice to me. I mean, I appreciate hospitality, but you got to draw the line. Some adult Bible college students, the way they dress, the low cuts, leaning forward while you're lecturing. You have to guard your heart, my friend. In the Western developed countries like USA, Australia, etc., where relationships are a bit more relaxed and out in the open, then in these cases, they're not necessarily employees but contacts, friends, connections, aren't we all, you and I, aren't we all surrounded by such situations, my friend? The issue is not the amount of temptation. Are you listening? The issue, the core issue is not the amount of temptations or the number of temptations, but the closeness of our walk with God. Shall I say that again? The core issue is not the amount or the numbers of our temptations, but the closeness of our walk with God, which will in turn determine the depth of our fear of God and will keep us from falling into temptation and sin. Jude 24 says, and I quote, Jude has only one chapter, so verse 24. Now to him, Cry out from your heart, my friend, if you are feeling tempted. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling. In ourselves we may stumble and trip and fall, but Jesus is able to keep us from falling. Amen. Pray this prayer. Pray this verse from your heart. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling or falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. So what is it that has kept me from being drawn in? Now, I don't just say from being drawn in, from being drawn in thus far. Because tomorrow, if I operate in the flesh, Satan can cause me to trip up. No one is immune, my friend. So what is it that's kept me from being drawn in thus far? I submit nothing but the fear of God coupled with the grace of God. The fear of God, coupled with the grace of God. As the saying goes, but for the grace of God, there go I. If ever you and I lose the fear of God, then we are no different to anyone else who does not know the living Christ, or who may profess to know the Lord, but is operating in the flesh and is out to take an advantage of any given situation to play the field. If I, I become another prime candidate just waiting to be picked off by the enemy and take a spill or a fall, if I yield to the flesh, if I walk in the flesh. It's like Samson and his hair. Let me read Judges 16 verse 19. And she made him sleep on her lap, and she called a barber who shaved the seven locks of his head. And his weakness began, and his power departed from him. The very instant his hair was cut, Samson became powerless. There's such a huge, powerful lesson for us all in this 
take heed, my friend. It is when we walk in the flesh that we lose the fear of God and fulfill the lusts of the flesh. I say that again. When we walk in the flesh, we lose the fear of God and fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Galatians 5, 16 and 17, and I read, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. There are, there are those I know of personally, personally. Some have been exposed while others are still at large, blatantly living an ungodly, immoral lifestyle. While still preaching from the pulpit, some of them broadcasting live on TV every Sunday. A couple of them get the ladies that they've gotten pregnant to have abortions in order to cover their sin. I said at the beginning of this, this is not for the faint of heart. A very good friend of ours bemoans the fact, a very good friend, personal friend of ours, bemoans the fact that his former pastor has stolen his wife, stolen her heart and emotions, which has resulted in our friend obtaining a divorce from his estranged wife while she and the pastor continue on in their ungodly relationship. Other pastors have acknowledged being physically abusive to their wives which means there are many other cases of emotional abuse. Physical abuse just doesn't happen overnight. Verbal abuse, emotional abuse. Another lady approached a senior pastor for money, get this, to have an abortion because she had become pregnant by another pastor who was under this minister's spiritual covering. This senior pastor refused the money for such a heinous procedure that is abortion. Understandably so, but this lady then, feeling bereft of all support, ended up committing suicide. Another ministry head fled his country of origin as the father of a destitute girl in his care discovered he had molested this man's impoverished and vulnerable young daughter. That father was out to take the life of this man. He fled the country. Yet another ministry head reports his close right-hand ministry aide suddenly and tragically died. No clear explanation given, just that it was some kind of accident. But that worker would have been the one person who would have seen and witnessed the sexual shenanigans going on on that ministry campus. Sounds a bit like a certain former American president and his wife, whose former close associates who knew too much suddenly either died or committed suicide. And I'm only touching on cases I know of firsthand. We must wake up and smell the roses, my friend. If a righteous indignation does not rise up within you, then it has to boil down to one of these three reasons. Are we ready? Number one, that you yourself have lost the fear of God, so you don't care about it. Or, number two, you are personally compromised in one or more of these areas, so you find yourself willing to cover up or gloss over such repulsive activities, even though they are by so-called men of God. Really, those are wolves in sheep's clothing. Or, number three, you could be given to what is aptly described as a greasy grace, where you just wink even at egregious sin. Oh, God's grace covers it all. That's fine. He's repented. He said he's sorry. He's cried some crocodile tears. And now we reinstate him into the pulpit. A greasy grace. We know that no one is perfect. All of us, I point to myself, are fallen, but mercifully redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and the grace of God. 
But here we are discussing those who claim to be called by God and are openly ministering the oracles of God or the word of God, yet at the same time brazenly living lives that are a shame and a reproach and a disgrace to the name of Christ. One such so-called minister who was finally exposed after having slept with scores of Yes, that's right. You heard me right. Scores of vulnerable young women under his charge. He said to me defiantly in a confrontational meeting with senior pastor witnesses present. He said to me defiantly, but my calling is of God. In other words, you're not willing to wink at my egregious sin. My calling is of God. And instantly I replied, and so was Saul's, King Saul's whose kingdom was rent from him. I said, and so was Saul's. He was silenced and the senior ministers present as witnesses could say nothing either. 2 Timothy 2.19, I read, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his and let Everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. The same scripture passage goes on to describe how some are vessels of gold and silver to honor, while others to dishonor. Let me read verses 20 and 21, 2 Timothy 2. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, vessels of honor, but also vessels of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Verse 21, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So in closing this up, my friend, it is incumbent upon us to fall in brokenness and humility at the foot of the cross of Christ and ask for God's grace and strength, which will help to make us overcomers. Oh, that on that day, we might be acknowledged as vessels of honor. Amen. If you've been blessed and you haven't yet, will you subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit the notification bell, like, share, and comment below. Thank you and God bless you.